Have you been trying to show up for yourself? Have you been trying to show up for your workouts? I'm Sarah Curry of Blaze Yoga and Pilates, and I'm here with my friend and colleague, functional nutritionist, Aaron Holt. We partner here at Blaze with Erin for programs, continuing education, and workshops because she's a brilliant woman, she's a charismatic educator, and she's a wealth of information. And we trust her to speak the truth to the $7 billion diet industry, to do the work and the research behind the information she's presenting, and to see each and every person that she works with and that we bring to her at the studio as an individual with unique needs. And we're here today to cut through all the noise the diet industry and talk about what it really means to fuel your body for fitness. Do you have questions about that? Have you maybe been doing keto and bonking during, during your workouts? Do you feel like you're doing all the right things, but you're still feeling like garbage all the time? Like this post and comment down below and let us know what you have for questions because we want to answer them. We had a great conversation for you today. So Aaron, what I've been noticing kind of ramping up since January is that a lot of my students who were formerly really strong in their practice are suddenly starting to not be able to finish exercises or really struggling towards the end of their workouts. Um, a lot of people this time of year are doing keto or paleo, Whole30, some of those like buy the shakes, buy the month diets. Can you help us to understand some of the main reasons that people would bonk during a workshop workout? Actually, maybe we should start by explaining what bonking means in case somebody doesn't know. Yeah, bonking is just like exactly what it sounds like. You go in, you try to like beast mode your workout, and you're not a beast. Um, you crash. Maybe you can you start out with more energy, but then as you get through your workout, you just totally crash, flatline. You're kind of just lying there. That's that's pretty much it, right? Okay. That was I that what you're seeing. Had that experience. People sure. having to sit down, feeling maybe like headachey or a little bit dizzy. Um, all of those things. You know, and there's more signs too that you're that you're you might not be fueling your body adequately. Um, if you're relying, this is a big one that I've been seeing lately. If you're relying on pre-workouts or caffeine to get through your workout, so pre-workouts are supplements that usually contain caffeine, mm -hmm. that give you kind of a boost before you go to the gym or before you go to the studio or whatever, um, or just needing to drink caffeine. I always think back to the time when I was would wake up super early in the morning, go to an early morning yoga class, then I'd go to work for eight hours, and then I'd run six miles at the end of work. And every single time before I ran, I'd have to pound espresso because I just didn't have any energy left. I didn't have enough gas in the tank to do the, the, the job. So I'd have to rely on these exogenous forms of energy, caffeine. Basically, I was asking my body to do too much, and I wasn't willing to admit it, right? right. Um, so if you're constantly needing some type of like extra energy before you go to your workout, that's a good sign that your diet isn't working for you. Um, if you're feeling chronically sore, now obviously after something, an intense workout like IHP, you're going to have some soreness. But if this soreness is going on for a long period of time and doesn't really make sense, that could be a good indication that you're not adequately fueled. If you're not seeing... Um, if you're lacking muscle or you're, you're either losing muscle mass or you're not putting it on despite putting in the effort, that's a good sign that your diet isn't working. And a big, big one that I see a lot is sleep issues. So if you're having a hard time falling asleep at night, if you're falling asleep but you're not staying asleep during, during the night, that's a very good sign, under sign, or excuse me, a sign that you're underfed. Makes sense. For your workout. Yeah. So I guess the next thing would be like, well, why is this happening? You said you're seeing it a lot at your studios uh, in the past couple of months. Why is this happening? The number one reason that we would see this is under eating. So if you're not eating enough food or not eating enough calories in general, we're going to see bonking during workouts. Um, now that's not really the message we're getting from the fitness industry. We're getting the message that like you need to be in a calorie deficit. Right. It's like the whole calories in, calories out thing. It's the whole story that we've been fed. Just move more, eat less. We know it doesn't work. I mean, we, can, we can look around and we can see that it's not working. So my thing is like, if we've been doing something that hasn't worked, maybe it's time to try something new. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I really, you know, for, for under eating, we're probably doing it because we're trying to lose weight right? Or we're trying to change ourselves aesthetically. And that, that's fine. You know, there's no shame in that game. If that's, if that's your MO, then go for it. The problem, and I think the, the mental switch that needs to come in is thinking about it as weight loss or uh, fat loss. And instead, I'd like, to, I'd like people to think of it more as 
building, like change that mentality. Because what we're really looking to do is build muscle. We're trying to put on lean muscle mass, right? I mean, we want to do that for a healthy metabolism. We want to do that for longevity. There's a number of different reasons that we want to build that lean muscle mass, but we have to think about it as build. You're not going to put on muscle mass in a calorie deficit. It's just not going to happen. In fact, it's more of a, a catabolic situation where you start to break down your own tissue if you're so underfed. So if your goal is to put on muscle and to build that lean muscle mass, you have to eat. You have to fuel your body. You have to get adequate calories in. Um, makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. The next thing that I see, and this is, this is just like across the board, especially with my ladies, is low blood sugar. I have been seeing it so much and so frequently that I actually created an entire four-week nutrition program just based on blood sugar regulation. It's car called the Carb Compatibility Project, and this is what we're really looking to do is just regulate blood sugar. Um, there's a number of different reasons we can have low blood sugar. One is what we just talked about, not eating you know, not eating appropriately, um, skipping meals. I know we're all very, very busy, um, but we still have to fuel ourselves, especially if we're showing up to an, in, like a in high intensity exercise, we have to fuel ourselves. I, like I get the whole busy thing. I, I, you know, I'm a mom, I run my own business, I manage a health condition just with, with diet and exercise alone. So I understand being busy. And I also kind of think that if I'm going to take time out of my day to go to a workout, to get to the studio, I want to make that workout count. I want the most bang for my buck. I want to show up and I want to be a badass. I want to work my ass off and then I want to leave and I want to feel really good about the work that I did. So if I'm showing up and bonking, that kind of sucks, right? So when you're, not, you're so busy, you don't have time to carve one, two hours out of your lifestyle to exercise. When you do get to show up, it better be, it better be good. It better be good. That's exactly right. Um, and that's, the, I mean, that's what's so great about interval training is you can get a kick-ass workout in a short period of time if you're appropriately fed. Um, so this whole low blood sugar thing. So if we're skipping meals, if we're thinking that we're too busy to eat, that puts us in a bad situation with blood sugar or for eating, uh, reaching for high carbohydrate foods, um, the standard American diet, or just the foods that we've been told are healthy. If you think about the old food pyramid, we don't use it anymore, thank God. But if you think about the old food pyramid, what was at the base? It was all the high carbohydrate, high refined carbs, grain food. Um, and what happens when we do that, we eat high carbohydrate foods, it spikes our blood sugar. When we have a blood sugar spike, when we have high blood sugar, insulin has to come in and grab blood sugar and take it out of, out of uh, the blood. And so then we... <laughs> so you don't die, right? And then, and then it crashes. Then we have low blood sugar. So if we're eating a high carbohydrate diet, we go through these swings throughout the day and it makes us feel really, really junky, especially in our workouts. It's very difficult to get a good handle on your workout if you have these low blood sugar issues. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I'm talking a lot about low blood sugar, but we know we can't, we can't ignore the fact that high blood sugar is a very big issue as well. Um, high blood sugar often goes hand in hand with insulin resistance. Um, and the cool thing about interval training is that it clears glucose and it clears insulin out of the blood. So when you're working out really hard, like in an IHP class, you're clearing glucose out of your bloodstream, which is a great thing if you have high blood sugar. It's not so great if you have low blood sugar because you already have, you know, you think about it, you have low blood sugar and then you're clearing more glucose out of the, out of the blood. That's going to make you feel really crappy really crappy. So it's why you have to get adequate fuel into your system. Now, if you do tend toward, I'm kind of swinging between the two and high blood sugar and low blood sugar, neither of them exist in vacuums. You can have high and low blood sugar throughout the course of the day. But if you fit that picture of high blood sugar, high insulin, um, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, mm -hmm. high cholesterol, metabolic syndrome, that whole pre-diabetic picture, which is huge. I mean, diabetes is an absolute epidemic. Um, I just heard recently that diabetes alone could potentially um, cripple and bankrupt U.S. healthcare in the next 20 years because it's such an expensive disease to manage. Right. Now, one thing that interval training does is it um, 
activate something called the AMPK pathway. And I won't get into like the, the dorky science behind that, but just know that pathway is central in uh, regulating blood sugar and it's central in regulating insulin. So we have to do things that activate this pathway if we want a proper control over our blood sugar in our a healthy metabolism, right? It basically tells your body, are you going to burn fat or are you going to store fat? So it's kind of a big deal for those of us who are in the fitness world, right? right. So when you do interval training, you're, you're activating this pathway, you're clearing high blood sugar out, you know, or blood sugar out of the blood, you're clearing insulin out of the blood. So all of those are really good reasons to do more interval training. And the cool thing about that is that studies show the higher the intensity, so the, the harder you're working and the higher the frequency so the more often you do it, the better the long-term results. We can't get intensity and we can't get frequency if we're bonking during our workouts. Right. It totally makes sense. Um, and then the final thing, you brought up ketogenic diet. So I really want to speak to that because it is very popular right now. And hey, I'm not knocking a ketogenic diet. There is robust research showing that these diets are extraordinarily therapeutic for a lot of people usually men, usually men. I, I don't see a lot of ladies thrive on ketogenic diet. Yes. Um, you know, we're just different than men, so it makes sense. But um, some people do need to be on a lower carbohydrate diet for health reasons. I'm one of those people. I've dealt with digestive issues my entire life, and I just do better with a low-carb diet. Um, but carbohydrate intake exists on a spectrum. So there's very low carb diets like a ketogenic diet. And then there's high carbohydrate diet like the standard American diet. And we talk about it like it's so black and white, either you're low carb or you're high carb. But the reality is there's so many shades of gray in between. And I do think finding your own carbohydrate tolerance is a really important thing to do for blood sugar regulation, for adequate fuel, and just for overall health. Where do you fit on that spectrum? And admitting to yourself that that could probably change. So this is something that I had to do recently because I started more interval training. I started going to more IHP classes and I started bonking. And that's really why we're talking about this today because I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And it's because I wasn't appropriately fueled. I didn't have adequate carbohydrate to, um, to support this style of workout. Now, where when we're doing interval training, if puts a higher glucose demand on ourselves. So we need more glucose. We need more carbohydrate. If you're doing a low carb diet and you're like, but I feel great. I love this and I don't want to give it up. Cool. But what you need to do is learn how to cycle your carbohydrate intake around your exercise. Because I don't think that we should have to sacrifice exercise especially one that we enjoy for the sake of our diet. And that's where that whole like mental flexibility piece comes in, right? We can do something that works really well for us and then it can stop working. And we have to have the ability to adapt and respond when external variables change in our lives, our diet might actually have to change along with them. And so that's something that I'm tinkering around with is just upping my carbohydrates um, in relation to the demands that I'm putting on my body. Does that make sense? It makes a ton, a ton of sense. And I think it really helps to like, understand for perspective in an in a interval training class like Inferno Hot Pilates to understand what's happening with your muscles. Now, you have two main types of muscle fibers, your slow twitch and your fast twitch muscle fibers. And your slow twitch muscle fibers, those are the ones that are designed to work all the time. The, one, the real structural muscles, your abdominal muscles. Now, all muscles have a combination, but like your abdominal muscles have way higher proportion of the slow twitch muscle fibers. And the slow twitch muscle fibers do a really good job of utilizing ketones as energy. And if you think like back to the famine, the ketones are really important. You know, we couldn't, didn't have access to sugar 24 hours a day. We didn't even have access to it 12 months a year. So to be able to make it across the plains and through the great, great, you know, famine of the winter, people needed to be able to just eat fats and meats and survive. And so few, using that to fuel your slow twitch muscles that you have to use all the time are really important. 
The problem is your fast switch muscle fibers don't do a good job of utilizing ketones and they require glycogen in order to fire. So when you're taking Pilates class, you may start the beginning where we're doing all this deep core activation work, strengthening your glutes and your abdominal muscles and you're totally cool until we stand up and start to use your fast twitch muscle fibers. Now your fast twitch muscles are the ones that fight or flight you. You usually don't need to use them for a long time. Even in the famine, right? You only needed to run away from the Jaguar for about 45 seconds. So if you're going to ask your body to do 30 minutes of major use of those fast twitch muscles, you better have some glycogen ready for them to use. I did not. I did not, Sarah. I did not have any <laughs> available glycogen. And I was dying. And I was like, but this is so fun and it's such a great workout. So I'm going to have to change my diet. And I think that what diet, the diet culture teaches us is that we don't have permission to do that. Like we don't have permission to course correct or to say, oh, this diet isn't, is, isn't working for me because it's always our fault, right? It's like, this diet doesn't work for me. Oh, there's something wrong with me. There's something bad about me when it's, no, it's just the diet stopped working for you and that's fine. How do we figure out how to do that, uh, how, to, how to adapt to that? And that's another thing that we do so extensively in my carb compatibility project is really figure out what works for you. We're so biochemically different, all of us. And that's why nutrition is not an exact science. That's why it's hard to nail down the answer. We're all looking for like the answer, the one answer. What should I eat? And it's so hard to do that because our, our bodies are all so, so different. Um, and we have to really be able to, um, to recognize that. Mm -hmm. A ton of our students here at Blaze have done the Carb Compatibility Project and really like had their minds blown about that type of stuff, thinking that they were going to like go lower and lower and lower carbs and feel better and better and better and then realize, oh my gosh, this is too low for me. I was so much happier at week two or wherever they were. And I think that's really, particularly as women, for us to get that permission that like, I'm craving more carbohydrate because I need it for what I do in the day is, is a really freeing experience. Yeah. It's like almost like giving yourself your own permission because you see it play out in real time. It's not like you, you know, people go, do go um, progressively more low carb. And some people are like, oh my God, this is the best I felt in years being this low carb. And some people are like, well, I'm dying. So like, <laughs> now it's time to add the carbs back in. But now you know that, right? Yeah. That that carbohydrate, this is one of the places that we're so individualized is how our bodies respond to carbohydrates. And it has a lot to do with the, the blood sugar stuff that I was talking about. So another big popular thing people have been really into lately is intermittent fasting and then like exercise or workout fasting. What's your take on that? So again, I'm not one to say intermittent fasting is the worst thing in the world. There's a lot of clinical research that that backs up there's there's some good things that come out of it um fasted workouts like you're saying are, are kind of in vogue right now and they could work for some people but here's who it's would be intermittent fasting would be contraindicated for anybody with a history of eating disorders or any type of food restriction restriction and uh restrictive patterns in their eating anybody with low blood sugar uh intermittent fasting and low blood sugar is an absolute disaster. Um, and anybody that has, is, is experiencing significant life stress. So I just like rattled off almost all of my clients, <laughs> like, almost like every woman on the planet. Um, so here's the deal. Fasting is a stressor to the body. It, it increases our, our stress hormones. And an interesting thing that I've noticed, especially women who try out intermittent fasting, the first week they feel awesome. They're like, oh my God, this is great. I have all the energy in the world. I can take on everything. And then after like five, six, seven days, they become a little bit irritable. And then the second week is when they feel like garbage. And I think what's going on here is that when you're fasting, your blood sugar drops low. If you don't have good control over blood sugar, it drops low. And then what happens is that stress hormones like cortisol kick in to bring your blood sugar back up. And that surge of stress hormones makes you feel like a freaking superhero for a few days. And right. then it makes you feel a little bit like irritable and like kind of cagey. And then you crash. So 
just be on the lookout for that. If you are trying intermittent fasting and you're like, I'm not, I do feel really good. Just be on the lookout for that. Does, can you sustain that? If you can't, it's probably not the fasting, but more so the stress reaction that's making you feel good initially. Um, but intermittent fasting is a stressor. And if you're already experiencing a lot of stress, or if you know you have cortisol dysregulation, HPA axis dysregulation, also known as adrenal fatigue, that you, you, you can't, attempt. It's a hard and fast no. Um, we know it, a lot of that stress that we experience is internally generated. Now, we know external stress can be very good for us. External stress is, it causes us to adapt and that's how we get stronger and that's how we get more resilient. It's like exercise, right? Our body's uh, responding and adapting to a stressor. But when you're already under stress, that external stressor should never be from food. It should never be diet related. That is a problem. Um, what you can do is use some heat therapy. So what you want to do is eat a diet that regulates your blood sugar. Don't do the intermittent fasting. Don't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Do something like the carb compatibility project. And then you can, you can build up that resiliency by stressing the system in other ways. A really good way to do that is through heat therapy. So getting into a hot environment like a sauna or I don't know, blaze, you know, a hot <laughs> yoga room. And that's going to put that, put that stress on your body, that external stress. It's going to get it stronger, force it to adapt. It's going to stimulate those heat shock proteins, which I'm sure you know a lot more about than I do. But the point is, it's going to build that resiliency without, um, without you having to starve yourself. That makes a ton of sense. Now you've kind of gone over it a, a little bit, but you know, we have been taught our whole entire lives not to trust how we feel, not to trust our hunger, to see hunger as a sign of weakness. Can you just like bullet point down the signs you would be having if you really aren't fueling your workouts right? Okay. Uh, the sleep thing, that's like the number one thing to be on the lookout for, for sure. Um, if you're feeling very, very sore, if you feel like you're not recovering from your workouts, like, oh, I used to be able to recover better, or it's taking me a really long time to recover. If you're sore in your, in your glutes, in your low back, that could be a big sign of uh, adrenal dysfunction and stress. Yeah. Uh, again, that lack of muscle, if you're not able to put on muscle, if you're bonking during workouts, um, if you've just got like a deep fatigue, either during your workout or after your workout, I usually say a sign of a good workout is if you feel more energized afterwards mm -hmm. and not like totally leveled. Um, if you're feeling leveled after your workout, you got to fuel yourself more appropriately. And then again, the, the reliance on any type of stimulant before you exercise. It's good to just go through those things over again. And you know, when you're doing an interval training, like, like IHP, you can expect to feel like you're giving everything that you have it's totally normal but like getting dizzy and seeing black spots all that stuff is like you know time to start listening to your body and sometimes for some of us we're so thick-headed that it takes literally falling down for us to listen to all those other signs that sound like it could be everything else you know it could be everything else in life Exactly, for sure. And you know, one thing that I just that I that I thought of, you guys do such a great job about talking about appropriate hydration and electrolytes. And um, something that's kind of overlooked is when you're on a ketogenic diet, when you're on a low carb diet, you're not holding on to water because carbohydrates will help you hold on to water. You're not holding on to water as much. You're also, it affects aldosterone. It affects your sodium retention. It affects your electrolytes. So those people on a, a low carb diet, a ketogenic diet really kind of have to double down on their electrolytes. In fact, I recommend a lot of people actually supplement with either trace minerals or electrolytes uh, or homemade electrolyte drink. But pair that up with the work that you do in the hot room and you're just dumping sweat. It's like you have to like quadruple down on the electrolytes. So that's an important thing. Just because since we did talk about the low carb thing, if anybody's listening, that's an important thing to pay attention to because some of the dizziness and the soreness could also be an electrolyte imbalance as well. For sure. And to remember too, like processes done in the heat in the human body the processes happen faster. You know, energy and heat are two sides of the same coin. So for us to be remembering that, you know, the work that we're doing in the hot room is the work of elite athletes. I mean, we need to treat these bodies like these really important vessels that are doing really good work. And remember that we metabolize everything faster, micronutrients, minerals, all of it. So it's going to be, it's a, it's important to start to think of yourself as if you would think if you were Michael Phelps, you know. That's a good way to look at it for sure. 
Um, so, so if we want people to come to class fueled, we want people to recover after, you know, in the fitness world, there's all this like protein this many minutes after and that many minutes before. How, how should people be getting ready and what should they do to recover afterward? So listen, there's a lot of validity to what you just said about timing protein and timing carbohydrates and getting things in at specific times. That's, that's real. But we have to like back up 10 steps and just look at what you're doing overall. Again, this, the, the whole pre and post workout nutrition is also going to exist on a spectrum. And on one side of the, 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 the spectrum, we have, we just have to look at our overall diet. Are you under fueling? Are you not eating enough across the board? Are you on a standard American diet? Your goal is just to make better choices and to stop skipping meals, right? Like that's your focus. Don't so worry so much about like sticking in the protein in different places and different times. Just focus on eating three meals a day and maybe a couple of snacks. It's sort of like when baby was asking Johnny to practice the lift you know, let's do the lift, Johnny, let's do the lift. And he's like, slow your roll, baby. Like you just started dancing two minutes ago. It's kind of like the same thing. Like just eat some food. Don't worry about the post-workout like supplementation and branch chain amino acids quite yet. You know what I'm saying? I do. So if you've been eating a real food diet and you feel like, yeah, I got the hang of this. I've got good blood sugar, all that kind of stuff. That's when you can start to tweak, tweak things around a little bit. Again, this is a large part of what we do with the carb compatibility project is trying to figure out what's appropriate for you and, and where you can tweak things. But one big thing that I will say is that after an in, like an in high intensity uh, interval training style exercise like IHP, before you eat, you want to allow your body enough time to get out of sympathetic mode, to get out of stress response, because we're putting you in stress response in that class. You want your body to calm down and to get into a parasympathetic state before you start eating, because you you are unable to efficient, efficiently metabolize food and your digestive system just can't handle it. Your digestive system kind of shuts down when you're in sympathetic mode. So give yourself a little time and space that's going to be different for everybody. But maybe stay in the hot room and do some deep breathing and some meditation for a couple of extra minutes before you come out and start and start eating. But usually a pretty good window is between 20 to 30 minutes after exercise. You do want to get some form of protein and carbohydrate into your system to refuel those muscles. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, um, just going into that, would you say, I've had a lot of students in the past say like, my belly's really sensitive in the morning. It's really hard for me to to eat before class, but now that we have the HIT training at the studio, uh, I think it's a lot easier to come to class on a you know morning fasted belly than it is and do yoga than it is to come and do IHP. Do you have any recommendations for those folks who like have a sensitive tummy or? Yeah, and this is where you start to play around a little bit and start to do some self auditing and figure out, hey, what works for me? But a couple of things to try. So if you're doing like this, you know, is it 6.30 a.m. class? You know, you might just actually get up and go and that you might be a good candidate for doing a fasted workout, but really have that ability to check in with yourself. Are you bonking? Are you getting dizzy? Do you have to sit down? Like, are things feeling a little chaotic inside your body? If the answer is yes, then try to do some really basic, straightforward carbohydrate, something like a banana. That's a pretty, pretty good safe bet. If, you know, maybe like a piece of gluten-free toast or something, something that's not going to sit in your belly. Uh, a little bit of protein and a little bit of carbohydrate can be really helpful pre-workout. Um, if you can't, I'm the type of person where I can't have much in my stomach at all. If I'm going to do a hard workout, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I have motility issues. Things just aren't moving through my body well. Um, so what I'll do is if I'm going to go to an early morning class, I'll be sure to get a, a fair amount of carbohydrate at my evening meal. No, it's not like you have to carb load, like you're going to run a marathon the next day, but maybe like a baked potato or a sweet potato or some hard winter squash. Be sure to get um, a good amount of carbohydrate at your evening meal and that should carry you over to an early morning workout. Awesome. So we do have something special to announce for you guys. Um, for anybody who, we have a little giveaway going on. Anybody who follows um, Erin on Instagram and sends a direct message, subscribes to her channel, Erin Holt Health on YouTube, can be, is going to be entered to win a free IHP class with her at Blaze and or at Steamhouse in Epping. Um, 
with Aaron. So make sure that you head on over to YouTube and Aaron will be like, hey, I'm popping over to this class today. You want to meet me there? Um, so that should be really fun. We're really excited to uh, get you guys to connect. And I want you to check out all the good content that she has going on over on YouTube. So it's Aaron Holt Health on YouTube or at Aaron Holt Health on Instagram. And make sure once you get to Instagram and you follow that you also send her a direct message. Cool. It's going to be, I just want to get more people in the hot room because it's such a fun class. And I think some people are a little bit nervous about doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm a sort of a nervous Nelly about trying new stuff, but it's always better with a, with a buddy. So come be my buddy. We'll work our asses off together. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be super fun. All right. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye.